Good. We'll be in Ezekiel chapter 18 tonight. Uh, We'll get through just over half of the chapter uh, tonight, and then we'll do a different study uh, for the Wednesday uh, teach next Wednesday, and then we'll finish Ezekiel 18 the following uh, Wednesday. Uh, Let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Lord, we ask that your presence would be known in our hearts and our lives and in this place. Lord, we pray for an outpouring of your spirit tonight. God, we pray that you would speak to us in this text as you correct the Israelites and some false beliefs they had about you. And I pray, God, that if we have any false beliefs about you or if there's these things that we're struggling in, uh to understand about you on our heart. Um, uh, Our mind tells us the truth of the word, and yet our heart sometimes struggles with the truth of your word. I pray that you would help us bridge the gap, and our hearts would be aligned with what we know to be true. So I pray that you would speak truth to us tonight by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So in this passage, God is going to refute a proverb that was going around during that day, both in the culture of the Canaanites and also specifically with the Israelites. And it was a proverb that had to do with children suffering for the sins of their parents. The Israelites believed that their current situation, being captives in Babylon, had to do with them being cursed for the sins of their fathers. The title of this teaching is Generational Curses Refuted. Generational Curses Refuted. In this text, God is going to clear up any false ideas or false beliefs or false understandings in regards to generational curses. Curses. We see when we look at the whole of Scripture, generational curses are not biblical. It's not what the Bible teaches. The verses that people use to support generational curses are often misinterpreted. God is not saying when He says things about visiting the iniquity of of the fathers upon the children and the children's children, He's not saying, I'm going to judge four generations from now Uh, people for the sins of this current generation. That's not what God is saying. What He's discussing, and we'll get into it further as we look at the text, He's saying that generations tend to commit the same sins as the generations before them. And children often commit the same sins as their parents. God judges people for their own sins, not the sins of of their parents. And there are many texts that come up, uh, but this actually pertains to the Babylonian exile as a whole. So I would like to look there at 2 Kings chapter 24. In 2 Kings chapter 24 verse 3, it says, Surely at the commandment of the Lord this came upon Judah to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh according to all that he had done and also because of the innocent blood that he had shed for he had uh, filled Jerusalem with innocent blood which the Lord would not pardon. So we look at that and we go, oh, Israel suffering because of the sins of Manasseh. But that's not exactly what God is saying. What He's saying is that Israelites were committing the same exact sins that Manasseh was. Manasseh was the most wicked king Judah ever had. He was Hezekiah's son, and though Hezekiah was righteous, Manasseh went the wrong way. He started uh, raising up idols in the temple. He was one who was sacrificing his children. He did the most horrific acts of any king of Judah. However, God had him captive, and through his captivity, through his trial, he actually repented. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, uh, verses 13 to 14, it talks about this. We'll get into it further uh, Uh, two weeks from now, but Manasseh actually repented. Uh, God gave him grace. God gave him mercy. Though he committed all these horrific acts, he ended up turning back to the Lord and he found forgiveness. Anyone who turns to the Lord will find forgiveness. God is not judging us because of the sins of our parents. 
The call to each and every generation, to each and every individual, has always been the same. God says, turn and live. Repent, turn to me, turn from your sins, and I will give you life and life more abundantly. Let's look at this text. It's Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. It says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, What do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? The idea is the fathers ate sour grapes, and the children had the sour taste in their mouth. This was a proverb that was stating that the children, the Israelites, were suffering for the sins of their fathers. That the Babylonian captivity happened just because for generations the, uh, the Israelites kept sinning against God. But they're being judged specifically for their own sins. Now this was a common belief during that time period. It was a cultural thing. It was a pagan idea that people suffered because of the sins of their ancestors. But God here is going to refute the idea and beliefs about this proverb. They had false beliefs about God. This proverb would suggest that God is not just. That we're suffering because of something else somebody else did, uh, which we can suffer for things that other people do, like somebody steals for us, from us or somebody kills us, but God's not punishing us for the sins of someone else. And we'll get into Adam and all of that next week, but not today. Um, but with this proverb, the Israelites were essentially accusing God of being a bad judge. They were accusing God uh, of being unfair. They were accusing God of basically contradicting His character of mercy and grace and justice and righteousness and holiness. This proverb was a direct attack on God's character. And He's had it. He's done with it. He's going to address it. Now we'll see Jeremiah address the same proverb during the same time period. We'll look at that a little bit later. But both Jeremiah and Ezekiel saw this proverb, this doctrine as flawed. It was a form of fatalism to justify irresponsibility. Uh, they were basically saying, well, uh, we're in this predicament because of what my dad did, because of what my parents did, because of what my grandparents and great-grandparents did. But they were in this certain predicament because of what they did. It's because of their sins. Maybe you had a father that wasn't very nice to you. Uh, maybe he was very critical of you. He was very judgmental of you. Maybe he even abused you or abandoned you. And though that makes uh, plays such a factor in our lives and affects us, every part of our being, our, our heart, soul, mind, and strength, it affects all of us, how our parents dealt with us. We can't use the sins of our father as an excuse to justify our own behavior. We're still responsible for how we behave. We can't say, well, God, my parents treated me like this, so this is why I act the way that I do. God's not going to allow us to use that excuse. We're all responsible for our own behavior, and it's not our father's, it's not our mother's, it's not our parents' fault that we commit sin. It's nobody's fault, but our own. They pulled this idea from texts like these, one I pointed to you, but also in Exodus chapter 20, in verse 5. No, that's not right. Hmm. Where is that? I cannot find it. It's 25? Page 65? 
Anyways, um, God talks about visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children. And they would use this text, they would use this verse to say, hey, we're suffering for the sins of our fathers, for the sins of our ancestors. Once again, we're in this predicament because of something someone else did. But that's not what God is saying. As I mentioned in the intro, what God is saying is that there tends to be this pattern of behavior between children and parents. Parents often, or sorry, children often follow in their parents' footsteps. And this is point number one. Our children often follow in our footsteps. Our children often follow in our footsteps. And we see this from an early age, right? You see kids doing the same exact things that we do, right? They want to drink the things that we want to drink. They want to eat the food that we want to eat. They want to do everything that we want to do. Jude tries to work out with me. He, he tries to drink everything I drink. But if I'm drinking like coffee or something like that, no, Jude, you can't drink everything that I drink. You can't eat everything that I eat. You can't think, do everything that I do. And sometimes we do dumb things. And we say dumb things that we shouldn't say in front of our kids. Like the other day, I said a Christian curse word. I said the C-R-A-P word in front of Jude. And literally, as soon as I said it, he said it right after me. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And it was so funny. I had an example in my notes before that about parents who say curse words and their kids say curse words. And then it just happened to me. I don't think that's a curse word. It's a Christian curse word, right? Uh, and I don't even remember what it was. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is perfect. Um, I won't say it in front of him again. At least I'll try. But this is true, right? We, we follow in our parents' footsteps, and our children follow in our footsteps. I remember during my uh, brother's wedding a couple weeks ago, uh, my dad was talking about how he wished he knew more biblical principles when we were younger to help us better understand how to treat women and, and how to behave in marriage. And I'll say, like, my parents have always had an awesome marriage, like, there's no doubt when you see them that they are in love. They're very affectionate. They've always been that way. We grew up that way. Like, we knew our parents were in love. Like, it was always like, they're kissing, and we're like, ew, but they did it all the time. But there was like, I was talking to my sister about this yesterday. There's like a sense of comfort that we had because we knew our parents were very tight. They were very close. Uh, but we didn't grow up really in a Christian home. You know, we'd go to church here and there, but we weren't raised in the ways of the Lord. And, and my dad wasn't, you know, he didn't study the Bible like he studies the Bible now. And he didn't really understand this concept of love and respect. And that's what he was getting at. He's like, I wish I would have known these principles earlier because he learned them three years ago. Uh, and, and it's played a major factor in his marriage. And, and because he didn't teach me those things, it definitely rubbed off on me in the, in the way that I viewed women and how I perceived thing, things. I didn't uh, have these tools, these principles to put into play. And sometimes it's more serious. Sometimes it's, it's addiction. Sometimes it's abuse. Sometimes it's habits that we don't want our kids doing and yet we do them and we tell them no but what we're doing is showing them what they should be doing more than what we're saying if we say one thing to our kids and we do something else they're going to pick more up on what we're doing than what we're saying our life and our example is more of a testimony and more of a lesson for our children than our words so our actions got to line up with our words and if our actions are contradicting our words then we got to make those corrections. We follow our parents in so many different ways. Even in the way that we parent, right? <laughs> we say those things like, I'll never be like my father. And before you know it, I'm doing the things that my father did. I'll never be like my mother. And before you know it, you're doing the things that your mother did. And the very thing you said you wouldn't do, you start doing. Why? Because it's ingrained in you. It's embedded in you. You can't get away from it. This is how you were raised. And even if you know that it's wrong, it's still, this is how you were trained. This is what you saw. And it's in us innately to mimic what we see, especially with our parents. So we go about doing things, parenting the way that our parents parented, and we just go about it going through the motions without ever reflecting. Is this even right? Is what I'm doing as a parent the right way to parent? 
Or, or am I doing this all wrong? The point is that we follow in our parents' footsteps. Our children follow in our footsteps. However, God's not going to judge us for the footsteps of our parents. He's going to judge us for our footsteps, where we walk, what we do, what we say, how we think, what our parents do. They impact us, and they impact us for the rest of our lives, especially when it's extreme things. A, a father decides to divorce mom and, and, and leave the kids behind and pursue another relationship with someone else. That's going to be detrimental to the family. Uh, a mom gets caught up in addiction and, and relationships, and she just has man after man coming through the house. That's going to play a factor on how the kids view life and how they view relationships. What we do in front of our kids are going to impact them for the rest of their lives. So we've got to be careful. This is what's happening with the Israelites. They're not suffering for the sins of their fathers. They're committing the same sins as their fathers committed. He goes on to say in verse 3, As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. God answers this proverb first and He says, All souls are mine. Uh, meaning, the fathers aren't getting away with anything. Okay, Just because they didn't go through the Babylonian exile, don't think for a second that they're getting away with something they're not. They all have to come before the judgment seat of God. They're all going to be judged according to their sins. He says, all souls are mine, and the soul who sins shall die. God makes it clear that this proverb is not in line with His character. He is a just judge. And He holds each and every individual accountable for their own sins, not the sins of their parents. This is point number two. The soul who sins shall die. The soul who sins shall die. We are all personally accountable for our own sins. In Hebrews chapter 4, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, it says this, And there is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. He says, God sees everything. He, he sees everything we do. He hears everything we say. He even knows everything that goes on in our minds. Every wicked thought, every lustful thought, every angry thought, every jealous thought, every covetous thought, Every single thought that we have. And we're not just accountable for the things we do and the things we say. We're accountable for the things that we think. Uh, Jesus, He addresses the heart on the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about how adultery begins in the heart. Murder uh, begins in the heart with anger. None of us are getting away with, with anything. And we think maybe our parents got away with this. And now I'm suffering for what my parents did. It's not the case. We're all held accountable, each individual, for our sins. Jeremiah, as I mentioned before, Jeremiah refuted the same proverb in a very similar way while he was in Jerusalem. So we see so many of the things that God is speaking to Ezekiel, to the captives in Babylon. God is speaking to Jeremiah, to the captives there in Jerusalem. And he addresses the same proverb in Jeremiah chapter 31. Verse 29, he says, In those days they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. In other words, he who eats sour grapes is going to have the sour taste in his mouth. Not his kids, he will. He goes on to say in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 5, but if a man is just and does what is lawful and right 
And if he has not eaten on the mountains, nor lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, nor approached a woman during her impurity, if he has not oppressed anyone, but has restored to the debtor his pledge, has robbed no one by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry and covered the naked with his clothing, clothing if he has not exacted usury, nor taken any increase, but has withdrawn his hand from iniquity and executed true judgment between man and man. If he has walked in my statutes and kept my judgments faithfully, he is just. He shall surely live, says the Lord. So we see here in Ezekiel chapter 18, God is going to address three different people. Okay, He's going to address a father, his son, and his son. So we got a grandson, a father, and a son. The first one, the grandfather is righteous. The son of the grandfather, the father, he is wicked. And then the grandson is righteous. So some scholars suggest because these specific words and phrases traditionally had to do with kings, though it applies to everyone. We see some of this language also mentioned in Jeremiah as he's speaking specifically to kings and people in authority. This leads some scholars to believe that this is referring to three kings of Judah, uh, Hezekiah, uh, Manasseh, and Josiah. So Hezekiah was a righteous king. His son Manasseh was a wicked king. And then Josiah was actually the grandson of Manasseh. And he was a righteous king as well. But we can't read too much into the text. It could be applying to these kings. Uh, what's described about them is spot on. But we don't know if that was God's original intent or not. Or if he's just speaking generally. So we see this first person, the grandfather, he is righteous. He is one who seeks God, keeps his commandments, and God says, because of these things, he shall surely live. This is point number three. The soul who seeks God will live. The soul who seeks God will live. This was not a new idea, but rather something God spoke from the beginning, God speaks. I wish I could find the verse. But back in Exodus, wherever it is, right after he says, I'll get it to you. Uh, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children. He says, but showing mercy to those who love me and keep my commandments. Right after he says that. He says, yeah, uh, people are going to follow in the footsteps of of their parents, but that doesn't have to be the way. Those who seek me are going to find mercy. Those who seek me are going to find life. In this context, we see that every soul has an opportunity to choose to seek God and walk His way, or choose to reject God and walk His own way. We also see, where is it? It is 20? It's Exodus 20 verses 5 and 6? Dude, why did I miss that? I must have flipped to the wrong thing. All right, let's read it. Everybody read it. Oh, yeah, it is. It's right there. I just missed it because I saw verse 4, but in my Bible it's weird. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who keep, who love me and keep my commandments. There it is, folks. Thank you. I was right, and I didn't even know it. But we see this doesn't just pertain to man's relationship with God, but also man's relationships with each other. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, almost there, Deuteronomy 24, verse 16. It says here, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sins. 
uh, Deuteronomy specifically tells us that it's not just about God's relationship with man, that he's, uh, he is not a God who is judging people based on uh, the acts of their parents, but even for man, they shouldn't judge a child based on the acts of their parents. A child shouldn't die because of the sins of their parents. This also pertains practically to us. We shouldn't look down on kids because of what their parents did. And sometimes, oh, that's the son of so-and-so. That's the daughter of so-and-so. That's not how we should see people. Every individual is their own individual, and that's how God sees them. That's how we should see them. So we shouldn't judge them based on how wicked their parents were, nor should we uh, judge them based on how righteous their their parents were. You talk about pastor's kids. Sometimes pastor's kids are the worst kids in the world. It's because their parents was a, was a pastor uh, doesn't mean that they're going to be uh, righteous followers following the Lord. Now we see that the text here is pertaining to and speaking of physical life and death. God is talking about actual physical life and death. Though it does apply, we can connect spiritual life and spiritual death. We can certainly make the biblical connections between eternal life and the second death that happens there in Revelation chapter 20 when those who reject God are judged at the great white throne judgment and thrown into the lake of fire. It's referred to as the second death. Spiritually speaking, we know that there's one thing that we need to truly please God. and What is that? Faith right? In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to him must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We're rewarded with life, and life abundant. We're rewarded with grace. We're rewarded with mercy. This is all God is asking from us to, 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 to seek Him with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when we seek Him with our whole heart, mind, and strength, and we grasp His love and we engage with His love, we're going to have that desire to keep His commandments. This Scripture, this text is not technically referring to salvation because we know that keeping the law doesn't get you saved and, and nobody can keep the law. Again, he's speaking specifically in regards to physical death and physical life that comes upon those who reject God or keep His commandments. I want to look at some of these character qualities about this just man just to explain them. In verse 6 it says, He has not eaten on the mountain. So they would have these... Uh, these sacrificial ceremonial feasts to celebrate the worship of idols on these high peaks of mountains, which we discussed in the place uh, in the past. They're referred to as the high places. It also says here in verse 6, nor lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel. Uh, to lift your eyes up to an idol is to seek help from an idol. Instead of seeking help from God, uh, people were seeking help from idols, but not this man. He wasn't partaking in the sacrificial uh, feast for these false gods. He wasn't seeking help from idols. This man was a man that was set apart uh, during his day. It was the norm to engage in idolatry. But this man decided not to be a product of his environment. This man decided to be different than his culture. He decided to be a man who sought God and kept his commandments. Idolatry is all around us. Idolatry is the norm in our culture. And we have this tendency, just like the Israelites, to, to follow the crowd, the herd instinct, to just do what everybody else is doing. But just because everybody else is doing it isn't a good reason for us to do it, right? If they jumped off a cliff, would you jump off the cliff? But so many people are jumping off the cliffs, and they don't even realize it, often until... It's too late, and they hit the ground on the bottom of that cliff, on the bottom of that mountain. The Bible tells us we've got to be really careful about who we surround ourselves with. In 1 Corinthians 15.33, it talks about how bad company corrupts good morals. It doesn't matter how strong we think our relationship with the Lord is, but we are a product of our environment. If we surround ourselves with idolaters, we are going to worship idols. If we surround ourselves with good Bible-believing Christians that truly seek God, uh, we're going to be uh, people that seek God. 
Even if it's uh, we're hanging out with complacent, compromising Christians, guess what we're going to be? We're going to be complacent, compromising Christians. We are who we hang out with. We become who the people around us are, no matter how strong you think you are. The Bible tells us we've got to be really careful about who we surround ourselves with. This man must have been a man that found good company, that found people who were wise so that he didn't fall into the same practices as them. And even in the church, when we find ourselves around compromising, complacent Christians, we have a responsibility. We have a moral obligation to speak up and speak out about the sins that are going on in the church. I don't think it happens enough. I don't think people call each other out enough when they're falling into sin, whether it's the fear of man or the fear of, well, I mess up too, so I'm not going to say anything, or whatever the case may be. Peter makes it clear in 1 Peter 4.17, he says judgment begins in the house of God. Uh, How are we going to be able to judge the angels and judge the world when Jesus comes back and we rule and reign with Him if we can't judge each other? I'm not talking about condemning. We're called not to condemn each other. There's different words in the Greek. you got a krino and krino in the Greek. The words, uh, different words used for judgment. We're not supposed to condemn each other, but we are called to evaluate each other and say, hey, uh, when you're messing up, when you're compromising, when you're complacent, We're called to speak out and speak up always in love, never in anger unless it's righteous anger. The Bible tells us that we're called to speak the truth in love, call each other out when we're in compromise. Back to this man. This man was righteous. It says in verse 6 that he didn't defile his neighbor's wife. Obviously, he didn't commit uh, adultery or sexual immorality nor approached a woman during her impurity. He observed the uh, ceremonial and ritual laws that were listed in uh, Leviticus about sexual interactions. In Ezekiel 18.7, it says, If he has not oppressed anyone, but has restored to the debtor his pledge, has robbed no one by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry and covered the naked with clothing. So we see he starts discussing this man's, not just his personal morality, but his morality between other people. Uh, He didn't steal from people. He didn't take advantage of people. He actually took care of people who were in need. He clothed those who were in need. He fed those who were hungry. It says in verse 8, if he has not exacted usury nor taken any increase, but has withdrawn his hand from iniquity and executed true judgment between man and man. Uh, We see that the Israelites weren't supposed to charge each other interest. Uh, Israelites weren't supposed to charge other Israelites interest. What what about, what does God think about the banks today? Um, This specifically had to do with the Israelites. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, it discusses how how the Israelites could actually charge uh, people who weren't an Israelite's interest. Uh, That's in Deuteronomy, sorry, 23 verse 20. He says here in verse 19, If he has walked in my statutes and kept my judgments faithfully, he is just, he shall surely live, says the Lord God. This man chose to keep God's commandments. He chose to follow the Mosaic law, though following the Mosaic law cannot save you. Uh, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 6, that concerning the law, he was blameless. That doesn't mean that Paul never sinned. It means that he kept the Mosaic law, and when he did sin, he would provide the appropriate sacrifices, because there were sacrifices that were connected to the law, depending on what kind of sacrifice was needed uh, at the time. So this man is not perfect. He's not a perfect man, uh, but he's keeping the Mosaic law in the sense that, hey, he messes up, he provides a sacrifice. So we know that this isn't the way to salvation, but it was the way to physical life, so that he wouldn't receive the divine judgment that was coming to those who dwelt in Jerusalem during the final siege of Babylon. In Ezekiel chapter 18, 
verse 10, we see his son here. If he begets a son who is a robber or a shedder of blood, who does any of these things and does, n- does none of those duties, but has eaten on the mountains or defiled his neighbor's wife, if he has oppressed the poor and needy, robbed by violence, not restored the pledge, lifted his eyes to the idols, or committed abominations, if he has exacted usury nor ta- or taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live. If he has done any of these abominations, he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. So, the righteous grandfather has this rebellious son, this wicked son who committed all kinds of wicked acts. And God makes it clear that this son is going to bear his own guilt. And his father's righteousness cannot save him. It doesn't matter if his father was the most righteous saint in all the land. His father's righteousness could not save this man because he was responsible for his own sins. He he decided personally that he was going to rebel against the Lord regardless of the way that he grew up, regardless of the example that his father set. As parents, uh, we can't force our kids to follow Jesus. And kids can't use their parents' relationship as an avenue for salvation. Uh, Our parents' relationship with Jesus cannot save us. It it can impact us, it can affect us, but it can't save us. And this is what the Israelites were doing during this time period. They were putting their hope in Abraham's relationship with God, their ancestor. Oh, we received the promise because God made this promise to Abraham, and that was partially true concerning the promised land, but it had nothing to do with their salvation. It had nothing to do with their relationship with God. It had to do with what God said to Abraham, that he'd be the father of many nations, and he would give the Israelites the promised land. Yeah, they benefit from that, but they don't benefit in the sense that they inherit the relationship that Abraham had with God. John the Baptist, he uh, addresses this in Luke chapter 3. In Luke chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as your father, as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Just like in Ezekiel's day, In Jesus' day, they were doing the same thing. We're putting our hope in a promise that God made to Abraham thousands of years ago. And yeah, again, there's a benefit from the promise, but they don't get to inherit eternal life because of Abraham's relationship with God. We see that Abraham's relationship with God was based on faith. It says that he believed in God's promise and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And this is how we are able to enter into a relationship with God. It's the same. Though Abraham looked forward to the promises fulfilled concerning the Messiah and he believed them, but we look backwards to the promise of the Messiah already being fulfilled. But both of these situations, these scenarios, require faith. And through faith, Paul tells us, we're declared righteous. We're declared righteous by faith. When we put our trust in Jesus, our sins are wiped away and God sees us as if as if we're perfect. As if we're purified. This is one of the differences between Islam and Christianity. This is one of the reasons Islam is spreading more rapidly than Christianity. You are born a Muslim. In Islam, what your parents were, you become. In Christianity, you are born a sinner. And you have your own responsibility and your own decision to make concerning whether or not you choose to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can't be grandfathered in to a relationship with God. It doesn't work like that. So this man we see as he's described as the complete opposite of his father. Everything that his father did, he didn't do. And everything his father didn't do, he ended up doing. He, he ate and, and engaged in these sacrificial ceremonies to worship idols. He committed sexual immorality. Uh, he committed uh, adultery. He took advantage of people. And this is why many believe that this is referring to Manasseh, the first 
text lines up with Hezekiah. This lines up with Manasseh. Again, we can't say for sure, but he did just about every wicked thing you could possibly do. It was like he was on a mission to rebel against every law of God. And God says, he asked the question, shall he then live? He shall not live. If he has done any of these abominations, he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. The son who practices wickedness is going to suffer the consequences of his own wickedness. His father's righteousness can't save him. Even if his father was wicked, it wouldn't affect him in the sense of divine judgment. He's going to suffer for the sins that he committed. In this text, his father didn't eat sour grapes, but the child ended up tasting the sourness in his mouth because the child ate sour grapes. In other words... He who eats sour grapes is going to have the sour taste in his mouth. This man chose to eat sour grapes. The text continues, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 14. We look at the grandson. If, however, he begets a son who sees all the sins which his father has done and considers but does not do likewise, who has not eaten on the mountains nor lifted his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, has not oppressed anyone, nor withheld a pledge, nor robbed by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry and covered the naked with clothing, who has withdrawn his hand from the poor and not received usury or increase, but has executed my judgments and walked in my statutes. He shall not die for the iniquity of his, of his father. He shall surely live. Ezekiel opens it up with this grandson, and this is probably the text that applies the most to the proverb. We see here three generations. In this third generation, we see though his father committed heinous crimes and sins against God and rebelled against God, this son is not going to suffer the consequences of his father. He's more like his grandfather than his father. And it says here in verse 14, look back at it, if whoever he begets a son who sees all the sins which his father has done and considers but does not do likewise, this child learned from the sins of his father. He didn't just say, hey, I grew up in this sinful home of rebellion against God, so I just rebelled against God. He knew that wasn't going to cut it. That wasn't going to work with God. That excuse meant nothing. He recognized he had a personal responsibility to respond to the law of God and this relationship with God, this choice to walk in obedience despite the sins of his father. He actually learned from the sins of his father. This is point number four. Learn from the sins of your father. Learn from the sins of your father or mother, parents in general, because the text about fathers and sons will use father. You're not your father. You're not your mother. You don't have to be like them. You don't have to follow in their footsteps. It may be your father was super hard on you, constantly beating you down, never building you up, always making you feel like you're not good enough. You don't have to act like that. You don't have to father your parents the same way or father your kids the same way that your father fathered you, though that's the tendency, though that's always going to be the pull because you were trained this way. It's like subconsciously, this is how I want to operate because this is how I was treated, but you don't have to be like that. Same thing goes with mothers. If your mother abandoned you or she engaged in all these uh all these relationships with men and the front door was like a revolving door of men and she had all these terrible relationships and brought these terrible men into your house. The tendency is going to want to be to fall into that pattern and have these broken relationships all the time and moving on to the next person and the next person. But you're not your mother. You don't have to act like your mother. God gives us a chance to be better than our mothers and our fathers. We have an opportunity we have a chance to be different. To follow the Lord the way we're called to. To be the fathers and mothers that He's chosen us to be. That He's created us to be. If your parents didn't wholeheartedly follow 
the Lord, don't use that as a reason to not wholeheartedly follow the Lord. Use it as a reason to wholeheartedly follow the Lord. Why? Because if people aren't wholeheartedly following the Lord, even if they're quote-unquote good parents, you're going to see some destructive tendencies and habits and behaviors and consequences. There are going to be things that you perceive that you go, wait, I don't want my relationship to be like that. I don't want to fall into those same habits and addictive behaviors or abusive behaviors or whatever the case may be. This man, he learned from the sins of his father's. Father. We, we got to learn from the sins of our parents, even if they were relatively good parents, because there's ultimately one parent that we're called to follow. That's God. It's Ephesians 5 1. It says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love, as Christ also loved us and has given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. God says, The only parent you need to be mimicking and imitating is me. That's the parent we're called to follow. That's the parent we're called to imitate. He's a perfect parent. He's a perfect father. He shows us exactly the way we're called to parent our children. He says, this man, in verse 17, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. Ezekiel makes it very clear that this righteous son is not going to face the consequences of his father, though he probably faced some consequences indirectly because his father was a terrible man. But as far as God's concerned, God's not going to judge him or curse him because of the sins of his father. No, he's going to reward him. He's going to give him life. He's going to give him the abundant life that came with keeping the commandments of God because God promised if they kept the commandments, it was a conditional covenant, if they kept the commandments, uh, things would go well for them. They would have abundance and fruitfulness and all these other blessings that God promised them if they kept the, their side of the Mosaic covenant. And this man, he did. Lastly, it says in verse 18, as for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, robbed his brother by violence, and did what is not good among his people, behold, he shall die for his iniquity. The righteousness of the son could not save the wickedness of the father. So the righteousness of the grandfather couldn't save the wickedness of the father, nor could the righteousness of the son save the wickedness of the father. This man was going to be judged. And we see this emphasis on the cruel man, on the sinful man, on the man that rejected the covenant of God. No matter what we do, we cannot save God our parents. No matter how sold out we are for Jesus, we cannot save our parents. Only Jesus can. All we can do is pray and take advantage of opportunities as they come. And I believe that this son, you know, we know this is an example. It could be applying to real people, but it certainly applies to some people. I'm sure this son took advantage of opportunities to reach out to his father. It sounds like the opportunities weren't effective, and this man ended up dying in his iniquity. But this man wouldn't just die for his own wickedness. We also see that this man, he led his son astray. And God makes it clear when fathers or leaders lead their flock or fathers lead their children astray, they will suffer serious consequences. This is point number five. Fathers who lead their children astray will suffer consequences. Fathers who lead their children astray will suffer consequences. And it's not just fathers. It's mothers as well. And in fact, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 18, it's anyone who leads a child astray, leads them to rebel against Jesus. It says here in Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. 
If we lead our children astray, there's a heavy price to pay. Jesus makes that clear right here. He says, you cause one of these little ones who believe in me to be led astray, it'd be better for you if a millstone was tied around your neck and you were or hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. Now drowning for the Israelites, that was like the worst death imaginable. So the disciples would have taken this seriously. And remember, they're like, oh, you want us to get the kids away from you? And she's like, you better not get these kids away from me. In other words, we see that kids have a important place in the Lord's heart. He has this huge heart for children. In fact, He uses children, even in that passage early on in Matthew chapter 18, as an example of of faith. They still have the wonder. They still have the awe. (laughs) They recognize that there is a God, there is a Creator, and when they recognize Jesus, it's, it's just this magical thing. And Jesus says, if you lead one of these little ones to rebel against Me, it is going to be bad for you. We have an important role as as parents. We know that every gift is from God, the Father of lights. James tells us we know that children are a are a treasure to God and a and a precious gift that He gives any parents, uh, whether a believer or unbeliever, and He expects us to be good stewards over those children. And if we lead those children, or if we give those children reasons to rebel against God, there's serious consequences to pay. I'm not saying if you're a Christian mom or dad and and you mess up and it leads your kid to rebel against God that you're going to be condemned to hell for it. We know that that's not the case but there will be consequences to pay. And if it's an unbelieving parent who leads their kids to to go astray from the Lord, yeah, there's some eternal consequences to pay. Either way, we know that Jesus takes it seriously when it comes to leading children astray. However, this text tells us that it's ultimately on the kids in regards to how they respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's ultimately on the individual in regards to how they choose to to follow the Lord or reject the Lord, regardless of whether or not the parent was a poor example and gave the kid every reason to rebel against the Lord. It's on that child who grows up and becomes an adult. It's on them to choose whether or not they want to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. God makes it clear in this text that He's not about generational curses, that He's not cursing the children because of the mistakes of their parents. The mistakes of the parents are going to affect the children, and there are going to be consequences that the children face if the parents are rebellious against God, but God's not uh, divinely judging them because of the mistakes that their parents made. We also see here there's that tendency for us to follow in our parents' footsteps, regardless of how we grew up, whether it was a Christian home or a non-Christian home, uh, whether it was a healthy home or a violent home, an abusive home or a loving home. Each and every one of us have a responsibility in regards to how we respond to the grace of Jesus Christ. And we can't blame our parents for the path that we go down. It's all on us. He gives each of us a chance to respond to the gospel. We all have a choice. Do we follow the examples of our earthly father, or do we follow the example of our heavenly father? The Lord says to imitate him as dear children and walk in love. Or we can fall into the pattern of imitating our earthly parents and fall into these vicious cycles of of destructive patterns. Or we can follow the Lord and experience the life that He promised us, the blessings that He promises us, the grace and the mercy that He promises us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. God, we thank You that You don't curse us for the sins of our fathers. Uh, We know we do inherit the curse of Adam. Um, Lord, we do suffer consequences. The whole world does for that, uh, Lord. But we know You're not divinely 
judging us um, based on the decisions of others. We have a personal responsibility to respond to you and seek you. And if we seek you, you promise we'll find you. And when we find you, we'll find life, we'll find grace, we'll find mercy, we'll find peace, we'll find love. Lord, so I pray that we would be people that don't blame our parents for the decisions that we make, for the things that have happened to us, for the direction that we go, but we would take ownership and choose to follow your example, even if we've had bad parenting examples. Lord, as we follow you, again, we would experience all the blessings that come with that, as we know you're a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. In Jesus' name, amen.